Victor Momo, I'm pleased to have, uh, I'd say in the studio, he's in Lagos actually, he's a petroleum engineer by practice whose love for data knows no bounds. He's a certified Microsoft Excel expert and a Microsoft Excel MVP from Nigeria. He's a passionate about knowledge sharing and runs with a couple of others, the Nigerian Excel, I'm trying English now, Excel users, NEU Telegram group, which is a home for Excel enthusiasts in Nigeria and now around the continent. His content can be found on his YouTube channel, Excel Moments, and on Twitter, uh, at Vicmo Excel. He'll probably put that up at the end of his video anyway. When he's not on Excel or solving Excel related problems, he can be found listening to music or playing the drums. Good man. So without further ado, let's put the video up. Welcome to Excel Virtually Global. And first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak at such a platform as this. My name is Victor Momo, and in this session, we are going to be talking about Power Automate Desktop. You know that automation is really the way to go, but I'm not just talking about Power Automate Desktop, you know, in the sense of just Power Automate Desktop, but I'll be focusing on the Microsoft Excel. And I've tagged this session, Mastering Power Automate Desktop, you know, through examples. Okay, so I would want to say maybe a little about myself uh, before I go into the session proper. Um, so my name is Victor Momo uh, from Nigeria. I think that's also important information to put out there. I typically always refer to myself as an Excel enthusiast. Um, by discipline and career, I'm a petroleum engineer, trained as a chemical engineer, but practicing as a petroleum engineer. Microsoft Excel MVP since um, April 2022, that's this year. I've been using Excel for a long time, but I'll say professionally since 2007. We certified Microsoft Excel experts for 2010, 2019, and 365. I trained Excel and DBA. I used to spend a lot of time on MrExcel.com. I don't have as much time anymore, but I have maybe over 4,000, you know, I'll say post responses there. I run a Telegram group, you know, with a couple of other admins and we call that the Nigerian Excel users, which is a group that has, you know, over 2,000, you know, Excel enthusiasts. Okay, what I really love about Excel, you know, advanced Excel array formulas back in the control shift enter days, maybe now I'm falling in love with dynamic arrays. Okay, VBA, yeah, you know, used to love that a lot. <laughs> now finding ways to do some of those things with Power Query and, you know, Power Automate. And, um, I think the last is probably the most important and passionate about, you know, teaching and sharing knowledge, which is why I look forward to use platforms like this. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at Vicmo Excel. Then my YouTube channel is Excel Moments. Um, so with that, I think we can go into, you know, what I have to share for today, which essentially will be three examples mm -hmm. on using Power Automate Desktop. And I'm sure at the end, you know, you would have learned quite a lot Maybe not enough to master it, but enough, you know, to get you up and running in automating, you know, your task and making life easier for you where you are. So let's get into it. Okay, now to the first example on Power Automate Desktop. This example is a very simple one. It's really about renaming files in a folder. But I may say renaming specifically Excel workbooks in a folder and subfolders. I'll explain the use case and how to approach it. So I have this folder here, which is called Excel Training. If you look in there, you can see that I have, you know, folders, subfolders, right? And if you look in here, you can see that I have a mix and match of, you know, Excel workbooks and other file types. But the use case here is for renaming just, you know, the Excel workbooks. And you can see this situation where in maybe your offices you have particular folder structure, all the files are named, you know, 2019 underscore this. And when it gets to year 2020, you pretty much just copy that same structure and you want to maybe rename all the files to 2020 underscore. So there are many times you have to do that maybe based on the fiscal year. What I want to do in this example is really to just append, maybe say, you know, global summit, you know, um, as a prefix to all the Excel workbooks in the folder, the primary folder, which is Excel training and in all the sub folders. Okay, so it's really, you know, very simple. I typically want to 
able to restructure, you know, to my workflow by putting, you know, something on Excel just to map it out. So the first thing is maybe to get, you know, the folder, right? The folder where I would want to do the rename. So I get the folder, and once I get the folder, I would say essentially you know, rename, you know, the files. I will put maybe a filter, you know, filter to just you know Excel. So that would be like you know XLS, right? And then essentially I do the rename, which is just append maybe the text to all file names. So this is a very simple use case. So let's go into Power Automate Desktop and let's see how we can get this up and running so that we can put some action to those words. So I will do new flow and uh, I'll call this, you know, maybe rename workbox. Okay, so this is a very simple use case, but comes in handy. These are the kind of things you typically would do with VBA, but people are like, oh, VBA, that's difficult. Okay, so let's do it outside of VBA. And I think Power Automate is, um, desktop is a very good alternative. All right, so the first thing is to get, you know, that folder, right? Okay, so I can say folder, just do a search here, and you kind of see what you want. You can see get files in folder. Okay, so I put that on the canvas. Now, the first thing is I need to point to the location of the folder. So I can do this here. Show folder. That folder is on my desktop and it's called Excel Training. I could go back there just so that you see it's the same one. Desktop Excel Training. So no tricks here. <laughs> so Excel Training, I do OK. Right? Now for the file filter, since I wanted to work on just Excel files, as Excel workbooks, I could just do an Excel S, maybe star. In this case, maybe I'm interested in just Excel SX, Excel SB, Excel SM. Good. Now, the other thing is, do I want to include subfolders? In this case, yes. So I slide this over to the right to say include subfolders. In advance, that's if you want to do things like maybe sorting, you know, so you can see, or you want to sort, you know, by certain criteria. But that's not important in this case. Because at the end of the day, we are just renaming, you know, every worksheet in that folder and subfolder. So since all of them will get renamed, you know, there isn't any need for a sort. So once this is done, it's going to create a variable called files. And that variable called files is going to be an object that has a list of all the files in, you know, that folder that meets the criteria of, you know, being XLS anything, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So it's not just every file in the folder and subfolders, but every file in this folder and subfolders that has, you know, an XLS as an extension, right? So we can do, you know, save, right? So now that we have that, we can now loop through these variable files. So loop through and for every file, we then do the rename. So that's really what it is. So now what we just need to have is just a loop within which we are going to do the rename. So let me just come out of here. I typically just like to search for the action here, but sometimes it's good to know where these things are found. So you can use a for each, okay? So if you are conversant with loops, you could go either way. You could use the loop, you could use the for each. My brain kind of works with either one. Okay, so value to iterate. We are iterating over the variable files. Okay, that's even the only variable we have here, right? Files. And now, what do we want to call each um, file in that files variable? I may want to call it maybe current file or something. Okay, maybe they have current item. Maybe current file is good. So every time it loops, every file will become the current file and then tell it what you want it to do. So we do save, right? So now we have the loop in between here, between the for each and the end is where we are going to do the rename. So let's just search for that. You will see rename and you will see a couple of them, but the one we are interested in is rename file or files. Okay, so let's just do this. You could also maybe decide not to do it with a loop, but it's good to see how this is done. So now <laughs> it now says, oh, okay, fine file to rename so what's the file to rename once it gets into this loop you know that current file is the variable that holds you know the file right so we can here just select the variable and say current file okay you select that good now what do you want to do in terms of the rename scheme there are a couple of interesting options here you want to just set a new name add text to remove text in this case i want to add text because i want to add you know global summits 
okay, as in as a prefix. So I'm going to say add text. It says what text you want to add. I'm just going to put maybe global summit underscore. Okay, and are you adding the text as a prefix and as a suffix? Here it's saying after name, or I want it before the name. All right, if the file exists, this is a case where you rename and the new file name already exists. What do you want it to do? Okay, I don't emphasize that happening in our case, right? So this is not a problem. I can leave it as what to do, nothing. And the variable in this case that is created is called renamed files, which I think is a very good name. And essentially, I would do save. Okay, so this looks like it's good. So if you just recap, it's going to get a list of files. It's going to look through them and it's going to rename, you know, those files, right? And that's pretty much it. So let's run this and we go check, you know, the folder and see if that's happening, right? Don't forget. So this is the folder. Every file that is an XLS, you know, should have the global summit prefix. Okay, looks like it's taking quite some time. Okay, it's done. 15, 16 seconds. I think that's faster than any human can do it. So let's go in. Let's see. So if you check this folder, for example, you can see there's a global summit underscore there, right? Okay, let's open this one here. So now you see there's global summit underscore. Okay, and the files that are not XLS, X's or M's or B's, you can see remote opportunity because the PDF file, it doesn't have the prefix, okay? So the prefix worked on just the Excel workbooks, right? So you can see that that worked very quickly and you didn't have to write any code per se. So um, just to maybe take this back to how it was before, what I would do now is rather than do add text, I could decide to do remove text or replace text, okay? So I could say replace text, for example, and I take that global summit underscore, and say replace it with nothing, essentially trying to revert to how it was before, right? So global summit underscore will be replaced with nothing, so the names should be back to their default. So let's do save and let's rerun this. And let's see what we have now. It should take about maybe 14, 15 seconds on my PC, which is not the fastest of PCs right now. <laughs> okay, 14, I think we are there, yeah. All right, so let's go back and you can see that status quo as in is now maintained. So all the files are now back to their original name. So that's the first use case, which is a very simple one, which is something done outside of Excel. So we'll move into, you know, the second example where we actually do something within, you know, Excel itself. I may just choose to save this flow. Okay. And then would have another one created. So let's look at the second use case. So I'm going to pull up uh, this folder again. I don't know why I closed it. So on my desktop, I have find replace PAD. All right, so let me explain the scenario here and you know how useful this can be. So what I want to do here is to do a find and replace across multiple workbooks and each workbook containing multiple sheets. Okay, so let me open, you know, one of these just so that we can see what's going on in there. So this is Australia, for example. You can see that there are five worksheets, right? Okay, January, February, May, and you can see date, product, quantity, and cost. So management has made the decision to change the name of this product, chocolate. So everywhere you have chocolate, they want it to be called dark bars. Okay, so... Don't ask me how I came up with that name, <laughs> but that's what it is. So we want to change, you know, chocolate, every chocolate to dark bars. So if you look through the worksheets, you can see that you have chocolate everywhere. And this is just one workbook and you have that across, you know, the other workbooks. Of course, you could easily do a control H, you know, that's a find and replace and across, you know, the workbook and open the next workbook and so on. If you have maybe like 100, 200, then you start to see that it may be important to have a flow that can help you do this. And it would be nice if the flow is also dynamic in some sense where, you know, you could um, have the variable um, re representing the text you want to find, maybe another variable representing the text you want to replace, you know, just so that it can be applied in some other instances. But I'll do, you know, the simple case, first of all, you know, just for us to see. And depending on time, 
I may show it with a variable, but that's not primarily my objective. Okay, so you get the scenario here. So you run a series of stores, okay, across these countries in Africa and, you know, in Australia. And now management has said, oh, okay, we need to change the name of this product. So you are looking through, you know, all the workbooks that you have in here and you're going to really find a replace across all of them. Taking chocolates and replacing it with what? You know, dark bars. Okay, so that's the um, scenario. And let's see, you know, how that's going to work. So just like the first one, I kind of want to document, you know, what my approach would be and see if that makes sense. And when we get into Power Automate, it's easier to do it because first of all, you need to get the logic. And once you get the logic, I think doing it in Power Automate, you know, should be easy. Okay, so the first thing, we know that we have a folder that has all those workbooks. So we need to locate that folder. So get the folder, you know, and maybe the files, you know, in there. Okay, I'm just going to write it in very interesting English, all right? We've done this in the first example, so this shouldn't be exactly strange, okay? So once you do this, the next thing is you definitely want to look through, you know, the files, right? So you want to look through the files in the folder. In this case, we don't have a subfolder based on my simple structure, so it's just a folder. Now, when you loop, what do you want to do? Of course, for every file there, you want to launch Excel and open the file. Okay, so let's just say here, you know, launch Excel and open, you know, the file. Okay, which in this case is, you know, the workbook. Once the workbook is open, of course, you go ahead and do the find and replace, right? So you can just do the find and replace. And once you do the find and replace, if Excel was launched, it would be nice to what? Close, you know, Excel when they are done. Essentially, this kind of looks like, you know, what we need to do, all right? And you go to the next file, it repeats, you know, the procedure. But what you will notice when you get into Power Automate Desktop is that for the find and replace, it only does it, you know, in the active worksheets, okay? So it means that it's not doing it across worksheets. It's doing it in the active worksheets. That's the only reason why you need to do a loop. So what it means is that when you come into that workbook, you now need to loop through all the worksheets in that workbook and make them the active um, worksheets then you can do the find and replace. So for that reason, you know, I will modify this slightly. So instead of just doing a find and replace here, so in this place here, I will loop through, you know, all the worksheets, okay? I'll loop through all the worksheets in the workbook, then I'll do the find and replace, and then I will close Excel and I'll come back to the next workbook, loop through all the worksheets. Of course, make them, each worksheet, the active sheets, find and replace, close Excel. So this is kind of what we are going to go through, okay? So now that you have this, I may come here every once, you know, in a while to just take a peep at it. You know, I think we can go into our automated desktop. So let's um, create a new flow. And this time we are going to call this uh, find and replace um, across workbooks. Naming is not exactly my strength, <laughs> you know, but... I think that's good enough for a name, at least something I can, you know, remember and relate to. Okay, so I'm more interested in the flow and getting it to work than actually name it. But yes, it's important to have a very good name. So you know how this starts. We are going to start, first of all, by, you know, getting the folder that has all those workbooks, right? So you can search here and do folder. Okay, so now you can say get files in folder. Right, so you drop that under the canvas. Here, you can select the folder. You know, this one is on my desktop. I'm using just the desktop for this. And I do find replace PED, right? So everyone can see it. Let's see, I think I kind of closed it there, desktop. Uh, find replace PED. Okay, so that's it there, right? So here, we can do, um, you know, XLS, even though I only have, you know, Excel workbooks in there, but that's fine. I don't need to include subfolders in this particular scenario, right? Because it's really just one folder. Of course, you can expand it into, you know, subfolders if you wanted to do that. And um, it's going to create a variable called files. Files is going to be an object that holds the list of all the files in, you know, that folder. So we can do save at this point, right? So once we have this, the next thing you know, of course, is we need to look through 
all the files in that folder, which technically is like saying, look through these variable files. Because these variable files now has, you know, everything you need. So I can pull up a for each, you know, which is the loop I've been using. So I pull up the for each, okay? And it says, okay, what are you iterating over? I'm iterating over that variable files, all right? That's what I'm going to iterate over. And for each of them, I could call them maybe current file. Maybe that's good. Right. So now, again, I know that this should work, but sometimes it may be nice to just test and see that before you go too far, that you know your flow is doing what it's supposed to do. In VBA, we have like the message box, which allows you to pop up things and, you know, see if things are in the right place. So here you have like a display message you know, um, action here. So you could do display message, which is really the equivalent of a message box. So what I want to do for this is just to display the name, you know, of every file, just to be sure that I'm getting the right thing. So I can just call this a default message. This is not important to me right now. The title, the message to display is what I really want. I want it to display current file. Current file is, you know, the file name every time when it's does the loop. Okay. So let's just do this and save. Let's run just to see. Okay, so sometimes you need to do things like this. I'm just showing it for that purpose. Okay, so you can see Australia, which is the first file there. It will go to Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Togo, Uganda. All right, so let's... Okay, I think it popped up somewhere there. Hmm. Okay. Let's run that again. I think I'm ready. Okay, so Australia... Egypt, right, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Togo, Uganda. Okay, so at least I know this is working well. So I could then maybe disable this, you know, delete it. All right. Okay, so now that we have, you know, the files, we know that this is working well. So for each of them, I'm going to launch, you know, Excel and open the file. Right, so I'm going to close this. You go down here to where you have Excel. And you can see launch Excel. Okay. So you can do launch Excel. So Excel now needs to open each of those files. You don't want to open a blank document, right? So what you want to do is you want to open, you know, a particular document, which you already know. That document is whatever you have in current file. So just pick that variable called current file here. You know, select that. Okay. Make the instance visible so that when it loops and does all of that, you can see it, right? So that's just why we are doing this. Open as read only. If you open as read only, this is when you don't want to make changes to the file. You just want to read from the file. If you want to write, make changes, like in this case, we want to change the word chocolate to dark bars, then, you know, we, we probably don't need to open it as read only. Okay. So now we can do um, save. But let me just show you that the name of this instance here, the variable is called Excel instance. So that when you see that subsequently, you know what it references. Okay. So now at this point, the file has been opened. Now, when the file is opened, don't forget from Excel what we wrote there is that after we've learned Excel, we now need to loop through all the worksheets. Okay, So we need to get a list of all the worksheets and then we loop through it. And all these variables and um, actions really already exist. You know, that's one beautiful thing with Ultimate. So you really just need to get them and drag and drop them. Okay, so if you go to Advanced, you can see Get All Excel Worksheets. Okay, so if you do this, this is going to create a variable that houses all the worksheets in that workbook. So now it has called that variable sheet names. I think that's a good, you know, name. Okay. So sheet names is a variable that has all the sheet names in that workbook. Okay. So now we have that list. Now that we have that list, that list of all the sheets in the workbook, we can then loop through this. Okay. So now we can pull up another for each, meaning now we want to loop through these variable sheet names, because sheet names has a list of all the sheets, okay? So we want to look through it. So do for each, so let's put it here. And now what are we looping through? We are looping through sheet names, because sheet names would have a list of all our sheets. So select and do sheet names, select. Now, when it goes through, it's going to create a variable for each sheet. Do you want to call it current item, or maybe you want to call it current sheet, okay? All right. So when it goes, it's going to, you know, the first sheet is the first thing it meets, then it's second sheet, third sheet, and so on. 
So what you want to do is this. Let me just show you why I'm doing it the way I've approached it. Again, I'm doing this because I know what Power Automate maybe has or doesn't have. So look at the find and replace here. It says find and replace in Excel worksheet. It says find and replace, you know, in the active worksheet of an Excel instance. So because I've read that and I see that it's in the active worksheet, what I'll try to do is to make every sheet active. When I make the sheet active, I'll do the find and replace. When it loops to the next sheet, I'll make it active to the find and replace. So now, if you um, just come out of here and, you know, just look at Excel, you would see that it has, you know, that already in terms of saying as a set active Excel worksheet. Okay. So now, by doing this, it means that whatever sheet you select at that point will be made the active sheet. That's where the find and replace becomes easy. So now, what do I want to do? The Excel instance is what it is. You know, active worksheet. Do you want to use the name of the index? If you are looping with like I equals to one to sheet count, you know, you can go with the index. You know, in this case, we can go with the name. Why is it good to go with the name? Because we already have this, you know, current sheet, which is going to house the name. So we can just pick current sheets as the name. So the worksheet name is current sheets. Okay. Right. So this is going to be, you know, pretty much easy. Right. Okay. So what it's going to do is that when it loops, it's going to set the first sheet as sheet one, right? As, as the active sheet, it goes the next time, sets the next one, sets the next one. So after it sets, that's when we now need to do the what? The find and replace. Okay. So once we know that that sheet is now active, it means we can now do the find and replace on that sheet. So you bring the find and replace and everything is inside of here. Okay. Good. So now this is the find and replace. What do you want to do? You want to just do a find? No, you want to do a find and replace. Okay, now this is important. If you don't do this, it's only going to look for the first instance, the first match. It looks for the first chocolate, changes it to dark bars, and that's it. But now you want to change all of them. So do all matches. Text to find. Here, that's what I was saying. I could have created a variable, and here I could pick the variable, you know, in such a way that it gives me like, you know, an input box where I can type in the name and say, this is what I want to find, this is what I want to replace. But here, I'm just going to keep it as is. This is the most difficult part of the flow. Creating that part of the variable is really easy. So, you know, I won't sweat that. So what text do I want to find? I want to find chocolate. Okay. So I want to find chocolate and I want to replace it with dark bars. Okay. These are the regular options you see when you open your find and replace dialog in Excel, where you have, oh, match entire cell content, you know, match the case to ensure that it's seen capital C and not, you know, lowercase C, stuff like that. But you don't need to do that in this case, right? So when I look at all of this, I think I'm fine with what it is I have. I do save, right? Okay. So at the end of all of this, after it loops through, you know, I want to close, you know, Excel then so that when it launches the next time, it's opening the next file. So I'm just going to pull, you know, close Excel in here. Typically, I just search, you know, I don't want to start opening up, <laughs> you know, so I just look for close and I know. Again, once you know the keywords after doing it a few times, it becomes easy. And the good thing here is that the Excel instance, of course, is tied to the instance that was created when you launched Excel. So you can see Excel instance, Excel instance. The good thing here is that you can just do a save document, okay? Because you don't want to make changes and not save. If not, you still end up seeing chocolate everywhere. And you save. This, maybe I can delete it so people don't get confused. All right. So now let's just walk through this and see if it makes sense. So get the files in the folder. Okay, that's the first thing. Then we now do a loop. You know, we look through all the files, we launch Excel. You know, when we launch Excel, the first thing is we want to get a list of all the worksheets in that workbook. Once we get that, you know, then we now look through all those sheets. Okay. And as we are looking through, we make sure that each sheet is set to be the active sheet. Once that sheet is set as the active sheet, we do the find and replace on it. And once we are done, we close Excel. Then when it comes the next time into, you know, the loop, it launches Excel. Now it's going to pick the second file you know, and so on. So it kind of feels like, you know, it makes sense logically, you know, if there's no syntax error, this should be fine. So let's do a play and let's see if this gets us what we want. Hopefully, you know, nothing is out of place. So it's going to launch Excel. It's going to open, you know, the first file, which is Australia, you know, as you can see. So it's going to, you know, make each sheet the active sheet. It's going to do the find and replace. When it's done, it's going to close. It's then going to launch, you know, the next one, you know, and let's see which that is. Okay. 
Yeah, that took, that took a little while. <laughs> okay. Like I said, my system is not the fastest right now. Needs to go for some rehab, but well, let's just, let's wait it out. I mean, we've come this far, we might as well just wait. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Yeah, but you know that if I had chosen to not make the instance visible, it means that all of this would have run in the background, right? If, and if this is running in the background, that's definitely going to be much faster. But you know, most times when you write scripts or codes, you always want to see it, you know, where they are not too sure if it's going to work or not. You want to see it as in when you see the ship moving around and, you know, things flashing here and there, it convinces you that, you know, it's working. So that's really what we are doing here. But ideally, you know, you can just make this run you know, silently, and that's fine. So let's see, which are we on here? This is Togo. This is the one before the last. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, time isn't too impressive. Yeah, but it's interesting that, you know, you can have this done across so many workbooks, you know, in folders and subfolders, you know, without you writing a single line of code. So let's go back and just open, you know, one of them and just convince ourselves, you know, that. Uh, it's done what we needed to do. Okay, so you can see dark bars. Let's go here. So let's do a control F for chocolate. Okay, so chocolate. Let's just do find all in okay. the sheet. Let's do in the workbook. Okay, so there isn't. So it's replaced that. Okay, now just to convince you that it's not just in Australia, we just open a random one there, maybe Nigeria, somewhere in between. If you worked for Nigeria, then, well, I'm Nigerian too. If you worked for Nigeria, then it probably worked everywhere. So you can see dark bars. You could do your control F again, find all. Yeah, so apparently everything, you know, worked perfectly. So um, that's the second flow, you know, find and replace across multiple workbooks with each workbook having multiple worksheets. Okay, so I'm going to save this and I'm going to close it. Okay, so this is example three. And in this one, I'm going to be sending, you know, emails from Excel through Outlook using Power Automate Desktop. This is something we get to do a lot. Maybe like if you're a recruitment manager and you have some applicants, you want to send, you know, personalized emails, their first name, their email addresses, specific attachments, and so on. You have a list in Excel this way, and you want to look through and send emails. Typically, we may do it with VBA, like I have some, you know, VBA behind here. It does it, but it would be nice to do it, you know, with Power Automate desktop, especially since people are always VBA averse. Okay, so normally, you know what I will do. I will kind of walk you through, you know, the workflow here before I go into Power Automate desktop. Save some time. I kind of have written what I think we need to do here. You know, we need to launch Outlook. We need to then launch Excel and open that file I just showed you, which has, you know, all the details that you need. We need to read in that data. Once we read in the data, we need to look from row to row so that we can then look at each record. You know, it's on a row. Once we look from row to row on each row, we will send an email. We'll close Excel and then we close Outlook. That's pretty much what it looks like. But let's get into Power Automate and, you know, get this done. And let's see if we can, you know, make this work fast. So I would say send emails from Excel, Outlook, PAD. I think I'm getting better with naming. <laughs> so let's create this and then see how quickly I can hit the ground running on this one. Um, so this should be interesting. And this is the last example I have, of course, in the interest of time. And if my system was any faster, then that would really help. So the first thing is, you know, Outlook. Okay, so let's launch Outlook. So we're just going to put that on the canvas. It's going to create an Outlook instance. That's fine. We are going to launch Excel. You're familiar with this drill already. So I guess you can cope with my pace. So we launch Excel and we just specify, you know, the file we want. We specify that file that has all those details, which is on my desktop, and it's called PAD Excel Outlook.xlsm. Okay, make the instance visible, that's fine. And this Excel instance is going to be called Excel instance. Okay, you know, save that. The next thing is you want to read the data, read that data into Power Automate. So let's just do read. Okay, so let's see, read from Excel worksheet. Great. Right, so this is the Excel instance. What do you want to read? A single cell? No, you want to read a range of cells. The start column, 
Let's just go to the data and see, right? We know we are starting in column A, so you could either use A or 1. So it's like starting in row 1, ending in, uh, sorry, in column 1 rather, row 1, column 1, and you're ending in column 7, which is G, and you know, row 6. Okay, so let's go back here. So start column is 1, start row, you know, is 1. End column, you're ending in column 7, end row is 6. Scroll down a little, you can go to advanced and you can say that, you know, the first line or range contains column names, right? So that it knows that row 1 contains, you know, your headers, okay? Pretty much, and you close this. For anybody who just looked at that, you realize that I've done something very, I would say, not professional, which is you have made the data very static by hard coding, you know, the end row and maybe the end column because this data can expand. Maybe you have more columns or you definitely have more rows. If you have more recipients to send it to. So you don't want to do that. You want to make the last row and last column, you know, dynamic. Our automated desktop already has something that helps. Now, it's tricky, but not so tricky. See what this is called. Guess first free column or row from Excel worksheet. Okay. So now if you put this here, it's going to create, you know, for you two variables, first free column, right? And what? First free row. Okay. But you need to understand this, and this is important, that the first free row, which is this, is different from the last used row. The first free row minus one is the last used row. Okay, so what we just need to do is to know where to stop, we need to just subtract one from the first free row and the same thing for the first free column. So when I come back in here, instead of using end column as this, I will pick a variable called um, first free column. I select that and I do minus one. So this is going to get me to where I need. Here, end row, I'm going to do the same thing. I do first free row, you know, minus one, right? And I'm going to save this. Okay, so now I have that data read in and it's going to be in a variable called Excel data. Now that I have it, I can then loop. I can loop from row to row in that Excel data and do what I need. Okay, so I'm going to close this and I'm going to use the different loop from what I have used before, which is for each. I'm going to just use loop. Okay, and the name is what it is. So where is it going to start from? I want it to start from row 2, you know, because I know that the first row is a header row. So I will say start from 2. Where should it end? I know that it should end on first free row minus one. I could have also created a variable, you know, and assigned it to the first free row minus one and increment by one, which is saying after two, go to row three, row four, row five, except you want to skip for any reason. If you don't, then this is fine. The variable is going to use there is loop index, not the greatest of names, but I'll take it. <laughs> so we do save, right? So now this is me looping from row to row. So in between each of these rows is where I'm going to send, you know, my email, right? Because once I know the row, then I can send the email with the details on that row. So that's pretty much, you know, it. So I'm going to send email, okay? The Outlook instance is the Outlook instance that you had here. So that's not changing. Account, I can use an account that I can send emails from, right? Now, who am I sending to? Let's go back to Excel, okay? So... I'm sending to the person in column E, right? So there are two ways to, you know, point to this column in, you know, Power Automate. Don't forget that Excel data, this is, you know, the variable that has, um, you know, all that data stored in, right? So you could use in square brackets. If you do something like this, let me just explain this. If you do this, the first square bracket is your row. The second square bracket is your column but they use zero indexing. So this means in Excel data, row two, column three. That's the meaning of this, row two, column three. But what you could do is that instead of also using this, you could also use the column headers, okay? So instead of using maybe, say, in this case, column five, you know, I would use required attendees, okay? So it's all dependent on you. So I can do, you know, required attendees, okay? Right? So this knows that it's picking from that column required attendees. Now, for the row, what do I need for the row? Don't forget, I already created a variable called loop index, right? Loop index, I said it's starting from row two. But understanding the zero indexing, okay? Now, this row here is going to be row one, right? This is going to be row one, right? And based on the fact that the first row is the header row, so this is going to be row one, and it's going to use an index of zero. 
Okay, this one is going to use an index of one, two. But I've already started my loop index same from two, you know, three, four. So essentially, if I do my loop index minus two, you know, it will give me my zero. If I do loop index minus two here, it will give me my one. So what it means is that to adjust my loop index to the zero indexing, I just need to do loop index minus two. So what I need to do instead of one here, I just pick my loop index variable, you know, I do loop index, you know, uh, minus two. Okay, so this one could be tricky, but let's see if I don't know if I need this in here. Let's see if I got that. Okay, so that's probably fine, right? So now that I have this, the CC is not any different. The only thing that will be different in the CC, that's who you are uh, putting in copy, are the optional attendees, for example. Let's assume, you know, I could just say, uh, you know, use optional attendees in this case. Okay, so I just put them. Okay, as that, let's leave the BCC. The subject, I could say invitation, you know, to an interview, something like that, All right? So now the body, we could do hello, and, you know, we need to put maybe the first name. Hello, Victor, okay? So I picked the same thing. I'm just going to change this to first name. So watch this. This is hello. Instead of optional attendees now, I will say hello, first name. Okay, right, and then say maybe you're cordially invited. I think I'm just keeping it very simple now. <laughs> and I do regards, you know, and I do Victor. Okay, so now you could have used, you know, HTML, and that gives you a lot of flexibility. You can then start adding, you know, making things bold, italics, underlines, maybe adding links. You know, that's really, you know, very interesting if you get into that. But this should suffice, you know, for what we want. The only thing that will be left, you know, would be, you know, the attachments. Okay. So um, let me handle that in an interesting way. Uh, let's save this first. Okay. So these are the attachments. I'm using those same files I used previously. Okay, but you can see that in here, I didn't put the parts. I just put the names of the file. So let me pick the parts. I will just name this maybe a variable, and then I can kind of concatenate it. So what I'm going to do is so that I can show you something else there. I go back here. I'll just create a variable. So variable, I'll say set variable just before I start all of this. Okay, so that variable is going to have this value. Maybe I put another slash, right? So this variable is called, maybe I just call it uh, file parts. Okay, right. So that variable is called file parts. So what it means is that in here for the attachments, I just need to concatenate the file parts with whatever I have in that column of attachments. Okay, because you can see this attachment column is just the name that I have there, right? So what it means is that in here, I can pull that variable uh, file parts. Okay, I can put file part and I can maybe do a concatenation with, you know, this same thing, but here I'm just going to be pointing to attachment part. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so watch those, uh, the percentage percentage. I think you just need to have them at the end. So instead of this here, I will call this attachment part. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, attachment part. Okay, yeah, looks like it's fine. So file parts, we have everything with a slash. Uh, put the attachment part. So this will now tell you the attachment it needs to send. Okay, so let's do save. It looks like it's fine. Uh, when we are done with this, you may want to close. You know that Excel that you opened. Okay, so we do close. Uh, so let's close Excel. Mm, here, okay. So it's going to close, you know, that instance. Yeah, I may decide not to save. So, well, I just do, I just do that. No, I need to have this outside of the room. Okay. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. All right. Okay. So now let's see the flow. So we launch Outlook, we launch Excel. You know, we read that data into Excel, we get the boundaries so that we know where the data ends. We get the first free row, the first free column. 
then you know reading that data is now dynamic we know where to stop so that we're not just reading you know static rows or even including empty rows right this variable is just to know where the attachments are that's this we loop you know through each row and we send the email and the email has all the details that you need in there okay so by pointing to the different columns um yes and i just think i kept it simple so let's run this and see um what happens if we get it to work so i think that file is already open it's going to open another instance okay so that's it yeah okay so i expect you know some emails to drop and i also expect you know some mailer demons uh because technically i use some email addresses there that <laughs> probably you know don't exist all right so let's see if we've received anything but the good thing is that the flow has run you know without any errors that's always you know my first joy but you can kind of see how i'm you know doing a mix and match of you know the for each for the loops i can use a loop too and then use a counter you know um so those are just some of the things i needed to show here you know how to use variables and then here how you could even maybe concatenate variables you just have to be careful to have the percentage at the boundaries how to reference data in excel when you have you know the table you can reference you know the column and the row using the indices or you could use you know um, like the column names like we are using here okay so i know some things have dropped in here so i may just take a peep at it and see okay so this is the one that should work all right and you can see that it says here hello victor you're cordially invited you know regards victor and you know australia.xlsx which was the attachment that was supposed to be in and to convince yourself you can see it's 2316 here this will drop 2315 so victor is not playing any tricks the other ones would have some miller demons and that's the reason why you can't see them okay so i definitely hope you have enjoyed you know uh, this series on power to make desktop just to show you that there's a lot you can do with flows you know without necessarily having to write codes but i would maybe argue that having some idea of writing codes you know gives you uh, maybe an edge you know in kind of understanding how to make it happen but as i always say all these things are subject you know to your creativity just study power to make desktop look at you know what options it has you know and based on that you kind of design your flow around it there are many other things you can do but i decided to just look at it in the context of you know excel like lamb said said oh it should be something related to excel so of course i wouldn't do power to make desktop for maybe extracting pdfs or you know um stuff like that i will have to bring it you know into excel in some way so um thank you for you know giving me this opportunity to present to you know the world and um i think this is the time where we get to take a question thank you very much Thanks very much, Victor. Mastering Power Automate Desktop through examples. I hope you found that as informative as uh, I did. I'm, I'm still trying to work out Power Automate myself, and we will. Uh, it's a slightly shorter title than before. Now I have Victor here with me, and I've got to say, while he's sorting out his camera, Victor, if you want to uh, put your camera on and come and say hello, we have got some questions for you. Um, so uh, yeah, welcome aboard from live from Lagos. So I think Sam's just going to put you uh, up on in a minute. I've been told off for taking control at all. So Victor, welcome, welcome from there. You talk with your hands as much as I do. <laughs> it, it's good to find a partner in the other part. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my parents used to say, if I if I were handcuffed, I wouldn't be able to talk. Now, I, I'd love I'd love to do the chit chat, but I'm conscious there are questions here, and I'm conscious of the okay. time. Thank you for getting up so early. We do appreciate. It. I think you've got the curtains drawn because it's probably pitch black outside. I don't know what, <laughs> what the weather is in uh, Lagos at the moment. But we've had three questions from PG. Now, people in the Q and A won't have seen them yet because I haven't published them, so I'll, I'll put them up as I go. So thank you, PG, for getting up uh, to for this session. So we're going to pass straight into them. 
So the first thing is with regards to Power Automate uh, Desktop or PAD, does PAD support regular expressions for renaming files? Oh yeah, regex right. Yes, it does. I, I haven't done it personally, yes, but I know it does. And um, you, you can find the article on you know the learn.microsoft.com. And I know there are one or two videos on YouTube um, that already have that. So maybe if I can just get a link, I could just post it in here. But yes, yes, absolutely. You, you put, yeah. put it in there and we will broadcast it to the world. So if, if you give it All to right. me, I will make sure it's there and we will also associate it with your video afterwards. And talking of the video, I know there might have been a couple of little sound gremlins in there for a while. That is not on the original video. We had a bit of interference from live from Sydney while we we're doing it. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but, but uh, uh, half of Australia has been underwater and I think that just caused a little bit of a gremlin there. So apologies if that ruined anyone's enjoyment. But PG has has had a few questions for you so i'm going to go for the second one it says how does pad compare with office scripts and vba and it's a two-parter he's also said also can i trigger office scripts vba refresh pivot tables and power query queries and i've just realized i've assigned gender there sorry if you happen to be uh, female or, or uh, uh, not not of a gender at all pg i didn't meant nothing it was a slip of the tongue oh, okay so, so the question is maybe yes, how you does, forgot. Uh, I, I've rambled so much, I forgot. <laughs> Let me do it again. Yes. How does PAD or P uh, Power to Make Desktop compare <laughs> with Office Scripts and VBA? I'll let you do that one first. Okay, all right. Um, again, maybe, well, the question is probably maybe not as explicit as I would want it because I'm saying compare in terms of, I don't know if it's specific to maybe the kind of tasks that, um, you know, we did here or maybe just generally. Uh, but then again, I think what I would say is that um, all of them have their place. For me, the situation or the scenario determines, you know, how I approach it right. OK, so um, fine. OK, VBA, it has to sit inside of Excel. It's power automate desktop. Then, you know, you can do your automation from outside of Excel. Office scripts now, yes, that works on Excel online probably also finding his way gradually into, um, you know, Excel for the desktop. So I, I think really they all have their, uh, you know, use cases. Um, they all can work. I think whichever one you're more comfortable with and depending on the scenario too, I think that would determine which way I swing, you know. So um, I, I think I would just evaluate it on a case by case basis. Yeah, but they all have, you know, their strengths and, you know, the pros and cons. So depending on the scenario i think i'll be able to give a more specific answer and say okay if you want to rename files <laughs> this is the way to go you know or if you want to send emails from excel or outlook this is the way to go but yeah uh, i think the scenario or the situation would drive you know how i how i choose to approach it yeah thank you i said it was a two-part i think some of you might have answered already in that but i'll just i'll go also can i trigger office scripts vba and refresh pivot tables and power query queries so is that triggering it from power to meet or just you know power automate yes yeah, the second part it. of the question yeah as i understand it yes oh okay so um if i remember i think jean jean's session on power automate and office scripts yesterday morning you know he did do that right you know he ran an office script from power automate but in his own case he actually did that from power automate not power automate desktop OK, so what he did was he created, you know, an office script, I think, for creating table of contents. Then he triggered it via Power Automate. But I haven't done that with Power Automate desktop, but you can do that with Power Automate if that maybe answers, you know, the question in some sense. Yeah. OK, no, thank you. And we have one more from PG. He's been, he or she has been prolific <laughs> here. So but it's good. We like questions. And if there's anyone else who's got any more, we've still got time. We've got about five minutes left here. So let me go through the next one. One issue with Power Query compared to other extract, transform and load or ETL tools is the inability to export transform data to a new file or different file format, CSV, etc. Can Power Automate Desktop be combined with Power Query to act as an option for automatic export of Power Query transform data to files? Well, that's a very interesting question. In all honesty, you know, haven't thought about that before. <laughs> that's OK. So you'll, yeah. you'll be coming back with an answer later on. That's all. That's all yeah. good. It's all right. It, the, the aim is not let's catch out everybody who comes on here today. It's, uh, it's no, yeah. we're all I mean, but, but, yeah, but, but it's interesting, really, just thinking about it. You know, being able to. OK, so Power Query helps you with the ETL. Then, yeah, you can do that, right? You can do that. So, OK, so if I get the question correctly, of course, the ETL would happen on Power Query. 
then Power Automate, of course, can, you know, ingest that data and then maybe spit it out in a different format. If that's what he's saying, it's definitely doable. I haven't done it, but I'm sure I can do it, you know, or I'm sure it can be done. Yes, it's really easy because, again, if you look at the last example I did, you know, I was able to read data from Excel, right? You know, I had a table, although not an actual Excel table, but I had data in there. So from Power Automate, I could connect to that. OK, so if I can connect to the table in Excel, read that data into Power Automate, then of course, I can always save it into whatever format. But I think it will be something I'll try. Maybe he's giving me an idea for my next YouTube video there. Ah, so, <laughs> so something to try out, but it should be doable. And if I'm able to do it, I'll probably post, you know, a link back to you again. <laughs> no, well, we, we welcome you to um, unlock Excel, <laughs> um, um, Excel virtually global or whatever we're calling it, Excel down under. We've, we, we've gone through a different whole load of different titles for this, but we will be running number nine next year and uh, probably not so late in the year. So we will look forward to welcoming you back with uh, your, your, your next inspired session there, Victor. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. No, not at all. We, we, we've got a couple more minutes now. I, I don't see any more questions in the q and I think we've covered those. If another one come in, fire off quickly. We've got to two more minutes. I, I think what I, I would actually ask you, conscious of the time here, Vic, what would you say are your top three tips for Power Automate Desktop if you're a newbie? Oh, OK, so um, <laughs> first thing, <laughs> read the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay that one. Yeah. <laughs> so read, and, and maybe two and three would be, don't forget number one. <laughs> <laughs> You've been asked this so, before, so, but haven't the point, <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't. It just came. Yeah, but 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 seriously, yes, because it, some of those things, although like you, you probably know better than I do that most of the things we get to really master, we master them through try and errors, you know, you know, but again, sometimes yeah, you're just stumbling and fiddling through things and you discover things, but it helps to when you have like, you know, some structure and a guide, which is why I always advise that for, you know, any application, you know, it's good to read the documentation. Some of the things I did today, I mean, that was because I actually read. So, you know, that. so to get to be familiar with it, yes, read the documentation very well. And I see that if you have some idea of, you know, VBA or coding, it kind of really helps. Because even though you're not writing any codes, but the workflows kind of follow the same logic, right? So if you have some idea of any, you know, type of, you know, coding, whatever language it is, I think that comes in handy. Then. I think the key things you need to master is just like in VBA, you know, mastering how to use um, maybe conditionals using an if, mastering yeah. how to use a loop, which is, you know, a loop and a for each, you know, mastering how to use variables. You know, those things, I think the fundamentals are still all the same, you know, variables help to simplify it, you know, if, of course, helps you to always, so that you don't run your code infinitely, you could put, uh, oh, okay, just run on this segment of it, then, you know, of course, for the loops, you know, you would always need to iterate whether you're iterating through workbooks, through worksheets, through rows, you know, so I think those are the key building blocks, you know, for it. If you master those, you know, you'll be fine. But at the end of the day, just do a lot of practice. I think, you know, you, you get it eventually, yes. Excellent. Um, in the meantime, uh, one of one of the team here, um, uh, Talia, who's been presenting, uh, sort of been linking between them, has actually presented earlier today. Uh, she's actually piped up in uh, the private meeting chat. We've got that um, she believes she can export the uh, table from Power Pivot in Power BI to CSV, uh, and uh, she's got a link in here. And what I'll do is I'll broadcast that and put that in the Q and A for people to read in a moment. So uh, thank you for okay. that, Talia. Um, look, I'm conscious we're almost out of time here. Uh, yeah. I've got to say, I, I noticed I was up at four this morning myself. Um, and, and PG's actually just asked one more question. Last question there, PG, <laughs> just very quickly. Thank, I was going to wrap up. To, How PG do I share? The session like yes, I was going to say, it's, we, we, we would have come up with others, don't we? But last, last question for now. How do I share a power to make desktop scripts with others? Just to finish off. OK, so. I would answer it in two parts. <laughs> First part is I haven't done it. The second part is this, what I would say, and this is maybe something I could have added, is that you can actually run Power Automate desktops flows, you know, from Power Automate itself. OK, so I mean, so what it means is that on Power Automate, you can always link to, um, you know, a Power Automate desktop and say, I want to run this desktop flow. So, so long as you can do that, it means that you can always share it just like you would share any of your Power Automate flows. I don't know if that kind of makes some sense, right? 
OK, so because you could do power automate and just do, oh, OK, run this flow maybe instantly or at the click of a button. But the fact that you can also run a desktop flow from power automate also means that, you know, you can also share, you know, the script from there. That would be how I would approach it. But yes, most of this work have been done like locally just on my desktop, so I haven't had to share them. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. We could keep going. and I'm sure PG would have another thousand questions with you. And if he's got any more. Yeah, he can link up with me on LinkedIn and the rest. Yes. Keep them going in the Q&A and if Victor, uh, Victor's happy to, he can happily go, go with you there. They, we're going through. He's got the rest of his work day. Uh, we're conscious of the time here. Um, thank you very much to Victor. We, we very much appreciate that. Um, what we're just putting up briefly here is, could you please provide feedback on this presentation using the below link, the bit.ly.evg 2022 feedback or the actual code for Victor? He would appreciate it, but he's going to be back next year. He's already got the ideas, so we, we'll be sending him back. It's excellent. I look forward to it. Um, thank you. You're welcome, Victor. Cheers. <laughs>